You're listening to the Leading Healthy Creative Teams podcast with Matt Curtis. This is the podcast that helps you take your creative team from wherever you are today to healthy and effective. Does this belong in my church or not? Should we be implementing this in our communication strategy or not? How are we supposed to make a reasonable decision about all of these different options? I feel like every week I'm seeing a new trending face on social media talking about how if I'm not doing this one thing, then I'm never going to get the attention of the group of people that I'm trying to get the attention of. It's frustrating for me as a business. It was frustrating for me as a creative leader in the church. And I imagine it can be frustrating for you as well. So this week on the podcast, I want to dig into this issue a little bit. And there's really two problems that kind of go hand in hand here. The first is that we forget what our role is in the church. And then the second is we need a little bit of a better framework when it comes to making decisions. What exactly are we looking for when we look at a new strategy or when we consider a new strategy? So the next time, you know, the new face on social media says to you, this is the thing you're missing. You can begin asking some smart questions to say, well, let's see, is this actually the thing that's missing? Let's evaluate it. The place where I feel like you have to start is understanding your role. It's so easy for us when we care about the ministry that's happening, that the ministry of the church that we're serving in, we get so attached to the mission that we forget what our role is in the mission. I'm going to read you a short passage from a book by Charles Ryrie. It's basic theology. It's a great overview theology book. I had to buy it when I was in college, have kept it around because it's a really accessible resource for me to pull off the shelf, glance at something quickly, either be reminded or get an answer on something that I'm studying. But I want to read you a passage. It's in the, in the section that's talking about salvation, specifically in the area of conviction. I thought that this passage did a really good job of reminding us what our role is as we serve the church as creatives or as communicators. How is conviction accomplished? Most likely several ways are involved. The spirit may speak directly to man's conscience, which though able to be seared, can still convict. He may speak through the written word. He may also use the spoken testimony or preached word. But whether or not people are involved in affecting this ministry of conviction, if conviction comes through an individual, the Spirit must do it. So there's an elevation of this idea here. It's the Holy Spirit that's working. We readily acknowledge that regeneration is the work of the Spirit, but we sometimes let ourselves think that our clever or convincing presentations can convict. Not so. God must do even that. I know for me, the more passionate I got, and really the more focused I got on the mission of the church that I was trying to support in my creative role, the more I started thinking that salvation was more involved with me than it actually is. In the case of this quote, conviction. Maybe this postcard is the thing that causes major change in the life of this person. I heard someone once say, we want to create a context in which the Holy Spirit works. We don't have the cause and effect ability to be able to do that. But we are to be faithful to what God has called us to as the local church in doing the things that the church is supposed to be doing. I want to set the stage here because I have met so many near burned out and stressed and overwhelmed creatives serving the church. There's this urgency that we need to adopt a new platform. There's an urgency that we need to be as active as possible in all of the different trending things of our day. The reality is that we do not control the work of the Holy Spirit. So much of what we're doing is actually an act of worship and an act of faithfulness. What this understanding has done for me, it, it has change the nature of what we're doing as creatives in the church. But we are not convincers of anything. Rather, we are informers. Our job as communicators is to be effective at informing the people, the body of Christ, the congregation, whatever language you want to use here. We want to inform them of what's happening and how this is beneficial for them as they pursue growth in their faith. Their growth is contingent on their submission to the work of the Spirit in their life. Our job in that is to present them opportunities where they can continue to move forward in their faith. 
The reason this is such an important starting point is because when we remember and recognize that the growth that's happening in the life of believers or the salvation that happens when an unbeliever comes to know Christ is not under our control. We are not the ones who are making that happen. We are participants in ministry. God allows us to participate in ministry with him. And it's a privilege and it's a joy. It should be a joy. When we begin to forget our role and when we assume that these major things are on our shoulders or on our plate, we become completely overwhelmed. And I think that's why so many in the church, not just in the creative space, but so many serving in the church, are just burdened unbearably by stress and overwhelm. It's because we're carrying the work that God is doing, but we're, we're carrying it on our shoulders. We're assuming that the responsibility belongs to us, and it doesn't. So what am I supposed to do if I see a new strategy and I'm not sure if it's going to be helpful for the church? Well, the first thing that you want to do is you want to assess your capacity. I sent out a chart. It's a workflow in the last Creative Bytes email. You can find it at lunchtimeheroes.co, and you can go to the resources menu and find past resources. It's called the decision-making workflow. Essentially, what we walk through in that is the process that we go through to vet an idea. There are two caveats that I'm going to add to the end of this, but the process is pretty straightforward. Really, what you're trying to do is you're trying to understand, is this something that we should be doing? you got to start with your mission. Is this something that is helpful to the mission of what we're trying to accomplish as a church? Does it fit our culture? Is it the kind of thing that makes sense for our church to be doing? So if your church is laid back, having a major hype event eh, doesn't seem like the right fit. If you're a very celebratory church and you have a ton of like big events, then fine. Maybe this makes sense if it's a hypey type of a thing. Does it fit your culture? Can we support it? Do we have the infrastructure that looks like budget, that looks like equipment, and that looks like staff time? Are we capable of pulling this thing off or is it going to provide an unnecessary level of complexity internally that we just can't sustain? You want to make sure that you're healthy in the things that you're bringing onto your plate. This is actually why I'm an advocate for not jumping onto social networks right when they come out because you don't know what the implication is going to be on your time. You have no idea how much energy and effort is going to go into sustaining that platform or that presence. You don't want to commit to it until you know that you're able to commit to it. So once you've gone through these things, is it on mission? Does it fit our culture? And can we support it? Now you can reach this point where you decide. Make the decision. Is this something that we want to do? Now the decision isn't the final step here. There's one more layer beyond that. If you decide not to do it, then, then you're done. <laughs> it's a bad fit. Don't do it. But if you decide that this is a good fit for your organization and it is something that you want to move forward with, you're then going to need to make the decision, do we do it now or do we do it later? Doing it now entails essentially dropping some things and reorienting everything that you're doing in order to do it now. Doing it later says we believe that this is a good fit for us, but we also recognize that there's a little bit of a uh, kind of like a cash flow issue in the sense that uh, we don't have enough free time now, but we will later. We don't have enough budget dollars now, but we will later. Equipment, we don't now, but later. So this is a little bit more of a delayed release, recognizing that there are some current limitations that will prevent you from making that decision. So that chart, again, is available. It's a free download, uh, decision-making workflow at lunchtimeheroes.co. There are two caveats, though, that I want to add on to this. The first here is as you're making a strategy decision, you want to ask the question, this point back to human relationship. One of the things that I found over the years is that ministry leaders were unintentionally asking me to help them have fewer relationships. That was not the expressed goal, so don't hear it that way. But what was happening is we kept asking for more and more communication pieces. The goal was to provide information, but what I was finding is that we were actually making it very difficult for somebody who was intrigued by an event or interested in an event to even get a personal connect outside of attending the event. Something that I found over time is that that made us a very kind of in a bubble type of organization. When you're talking about discipleship, you need personal relationship. The more we were allowing these types of promotional pieces to give away as much information as possible and prevent this personal interaction from happening, the more I would recognize that there are long-term negative impacts in that approach. We started hearing things like, I feel like the pastors aren't as accessible, 
or I feel like I can't talk to anybody if I have a problem. Now, those weren't real problems in the sense that there were still plenty of pathways to have those in-person or interpersonal conversations. What I found though was that when we automated away all of the relational touch points regarding events, it started feeling like we were not accessible for those other things as well. That was a big revelation for me. All of our communication needs to point people back to human relationships. In the context of the church, discipleship happens through relationship. I don't think that's a very debatable point. If you say, oh no, we can do this in isolation. I can just pull up a chart online and say, yeah, I discipled today. That's just not how it works. Relationship is a, a mandatory prerequisite for the process of discipleship. And so when we find ways to remove relationship from interactions, it's gonna be problematic over time. And that really leads us to this next point that is so important for us to consider anytime we're making a strategy adjustment. Is what we're about to do a trend or a long-term play? One of those boxes on this workflow is running things through the mission. As you're evaluating a new strategy or a new approach, you really have to weigh heavily the mission of the church. What are the objectives or the, the strategies that your church pursues when it comes to ministry? I've worked with churches that are very, very active in evangelism. Great. So how does this new strategy help that? Uh, one interesting tension. Some churches have uh, an approach to evangelism where the church itself is trying to be known and present in the community. There are other churches that are way more focused on empowering the individuals in the church family to go and do evangelism themselves. So there's an interesting tension between these two models. If I'm working at a church where the church wants to be known, then my advertising dollars should go to me. <laughs> they should go to major promotional ev uh, events or messaging campaigns, awareness, just major stuff. You know, you're talking radio, you're talking billboard, you're talking canvassing the community so that everybody knows about your church. If you go to a church that doesn't have that type of perspective, but instead is looking to empower people for personal ministry themselves, well, now all of a sudden, my budget dollar should go to something totally different. I should be investing in helping the congregation be equipped so that they are better prepared to have meaningful evangelism conversations in their world with the people that they're connected to. Maybe that looks like buying tracts. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. It's kind of an old school strategy, but whatever it is, it's that kind of thinking. It's to say, well, what can I give this person that now empowers them to be able to go and minister effectively? In a lot of cases, it's actually like online content. It's how do you have a conversation with your friend about Jesus? How do you learn some of the basic challenges that people have about faith? How do you learn some of the foundational, you know, basic systematic theology types of perspectives? How do you know what you believe? It's an apologetics conference. There's so many other ways that you can use that investment of funds beyond just like a billboard or an ad campaign. This comes up for us as communicators. And all of a sudden it's like, what in the world? We're talking about like how the church functions. Absolutely. Because as a communicator in the church, your job is to enhance and to be this kind of megaphone for the mission itself. So if the mission is to be known, then filter all of these decisions about new strategies through that lens. Does this help us be known? If the strategy is to equip, then run you every new strategy through this. Does this equip? Does this empower people to be able to embrace their personal mission in a more profound way? If discipleship is the primary focus, does this new strategy help us as we disciple our people? Those are the types of questions that we need to be asking as church communicators because we are the gateway between these amplifying tools, these amplifying strategies and platforms and the mission of our church. Where we run into so many problems and really we run into so much stress is when we're choosing platforms that actually philosophically conflict with the nature of how our church does ministry. For me, that was a real challenge. Early in my career, I wanted to pursue certain things because I saw it from a very missional perspective. When I started having conversations with leadership though, I realized that they saw these things differently. So the next time you see an amazing strategy that looks like this is the thing that you've been missing, do some due diligence of your own and assess it before you implement it 
so that you can make sure that what you're doing makes a lot of sense when it comes to the mission of your church. Thanks for listening to this episode of Leading Healthy Creative Teams. This podcast is just one of the ways Lunchtime Heroes helps build healthy creative teams in the church. Stay up to date on the latest by signing up for the Creative Bites email at lunchtimeheroes.co.